Uh, just like the optical illusions that we're all familiar with, uh, there are also ways to fool your brain with sound. And uh, in one, one particular example of this is the shepherd's tone. Uh, when you listen to this sequence of tones, it'll seem like every step is higher than the one before. But actually, what you're listening to is a loop of the same thing. And it doesn't keep going up, it just sounds like that, because once again, your brain is doing the best that it can to interpret what's going on, but it doesn't always get it right. When I started working uh, on my PhD, uh, I, I started working in a lab that was particularly interested in the spaces in between music and neuroscience. Um, not only because it's an interesting uh, topic to talk about, but also because it turns out to be really, really important for people with certain types of communications disorders. Um, when people are recovering from a certain type of stroke, they have great difficulty speaking. And their difficulty speaking isn't because of any kind of paralysis. It's actually because the faculty in their brain that converts ideas into language and into the speech motor programs that make that language come out is affected. And so a long time ago, doctors noticed that these patients, while they have a hard time speaking, they can still sing. So why is that? What's so special about singing? How does it engage the brain differently than speaking? And can we use it in a therapy? And it turns out that we can, and, and that's part of my thesis. Part of my thesis is looking at the brains of professional singers and finding out what's so different about them relative to people who don't sing. And that'll tell us a little bit about how we can finally tune the therapy um, to help benefit these patients. So just like music got me interested in neuroscience, doing work in neuroscience is really making me ask the question, not only how can different types of musical training change the brain, but how can different styles of teaching change the brain? And I think that this is a problem that we're having worldwide. What is the best way to educate an individual? What is the best way to educate a community? Usually we come at that problem from the top down by hiring the best teachers in the world or having the best facilities in the world. But I think that since the tools of neuroscience are starting to enable us to answer questions about education, why not have a complementary approach by having the opinion of neuroscientists? Because in the end, the goal of education is to educate the brain. So why not take a look at how different types of teaching change the brain? And then having that in the conversation of how we can make a better education system.